We did a chant just now from the Mangala Sutta. The word Mangala in Pali can mean both blessing and protection. And prior to the Buddha, it meant little ceremonies that you would do, little rituals you would do for the sake of blessing and protecting. And he was pointing out that the best protection comes from your own actions. The best blessing comes from your own actions. And you notice a list. Everything from who you hang out with, trying to choose wise people, helping your relatives, helping your parents, being generous, all the way up to experiencing nirvana and being an arahant. There's no clear dividing line between what what's mundane and what's transcendent there. It's all part of a continuum. It's an important point, because all too often we think that there are two kinds of practice. There's practice for coming back, being happy in the world, what's called merit Buddhism or karmic Buddhism. And then there's nibbanic Buddhism, which is aiming solely at release. And the descriptions usually make it seem like there are two antithetical types of practice. You can't do one and the other at the same time. That's in theory. But when you actually look at the way people practice, even in the forest, forest tradition, there's more of a continuum. Think of the example of the Buddha. He left home to find awakening. But he didn't abandon the people back home. After he found awakening, he came back. Tradition is that he taught his father to become an arahant. He taught his stepmother to become an arahant. He taught his mother up in heaven to become a stream enter. His wife to become a stream enter. He taught his son to become an arahant. He found a treasure and he wanted to share it. In the forest tradition, we have the example of the Ajans who would teach their parents, teach their family members. And of course, dedicate merit all along the way. Merit is one of those concepts that we tend not to think about too much in Western Buddhism, but it's very important. It's a combination of goodness and happiness at the same time. As the Buddha said, Acts of merit are another term for happiness. It operates on the same principle as the Four Noble Truths. In other words, the suffering that weighs down the mind is the suffering that we create for ourselves. The happiness that most uplifts the mind is the goodness we do. That's merit. You're looking for happiness in a way that causes no suffering to anyone at all. And it's something you create from within. And so its effects go within. And as all forms of happiness, there are people you're concerned about, people you love, people you have goodwill for, you'd like to share. Now the Buddha says there are certain people who are not in a position where they can rejoice in the merit of others and actually benefit from it. But there are a lot who can. And so for their sake we dedicate merit. Think of it dedicating happiness, dedicating goodness. And when you make up your mind that you want to do good to dedicate to others, it makes you more sensitive to the good that you can do as you go through the day. Three big categories generosity, virtue, meditation. Cover a lot of different activities. Generosity is a huge range of activities. Simple things like cleaning up the place, little acts of kindness. Anything that makes you feel good that you look at it and you've done something good. 
That's merit. Same with virtue, areas where you could have said something or done something that was not quite honorable, but you said no. You decided you wouldn't stoop to that. And that, of course, means if you have to stoop to do something like that, your normal posture should be straight up and something higher. There's an element of self-esteem in all of this, from the realization that, yes, you can create goodness. Even in difficult situations, you don't have to have things being really nice in order to be good. And the goodness you create is that really does go much deeper than the happiness that comes from simply having pleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, nice ideas. There's not much self-esteem that comes when you're simply following your desire for sensory pleasures, because you're not creating it yourself. You're becoming totally dependent on things outside, of course, this is more independent. Especially, of course, with meditation. When the meditation goes well, stop and think at the end. What I like to share this with, of course, you can't share the meditation, but the fact that you're dedicating the meditation to someone else. There are those who appreciate that, and they're happy for it, for the fact that you've thought of them. That's their merit that they pick up from this. And so even though we may be practicing for the sake of getting out of samsara, we still want to leave some good things behind. A picture of the, the selfish Theravadan who's simply concerned about release and isn't concerned about the world, is a caricature, and a very false one. It shows very little understanding of the Buddha's teachings on happiness. That when you create happiness, when you create goodness like this, you're not the only one who benefits. And what ties both what we could call mundane practice and transcendent practice together is a common thread of goodwill. Goodwill for yourself, goodwill for others. So that when you're meditating, your primary purpose may be for your own release, but you're happy to leave some dedication of merit behind. Even the motivation to want to get release. One of the factors that the Buddha mentions is that if you do gain release, then all those people who have helped you will gain a lot of merit. So it's not the case that we're just doing just for ourselves. We're doing it for anyone who sees that this is a good thing, sees that goodness is a good thing, sees that the happiness that is created from within is a good thing. Of course, there are people in the world who don't see that, and no matter how much you dedicate merit to them, they're not going to sense anything at all. But there are beings out there, there are people out there who really do appreciate this, and for them you're happy to share. Remember, even the Buddha couldn't teach everybody. She said, he's the foremost teacher of those fit to be tamed. Those fit to be tamed are the ones who want to be tamed. There are a lot who don't. So even though the Buddha's compassion and goodwill were totally without measure, there are only so many that he could help. Well, it's the same with the merit that we dedicate. There are only so many we can help, but we're happy to help them. And our own happiness is not diminished that way. All too often we talk about somebody getting a lot of merit. It makes it sound like it's a material thing that you can count. But just think about trying to count happiness. 
How many happinesses did you have today? It's, it's not the sort of thing you can say. It's something that's boundless. Now there may be greater or lesser intensity, but it's not a material thing. An image that's usually used as of lighting a candle. You light the candle, other people benefit from the light as well. If you take your candle and light someone else's candle, your flame is not reduced, and the brightness around gets increased. So when you think of merit, think of goodness, happiness, light. The goodness you create within, the happiness you create from within. These things spill out. And the same principle applies for the goodness we do for the world and the goodness we do for gaining release from the world. Think of the Buddha. He gained total release about 2,500 years ago, and we're still benefiting from what he did. Our personal influence may not be that broad, but it's the same sort of thing. This is a radiant practice. And when you think of it in those terms, it gives you even more energy to do more of it. So that the mind becomes a more radiant mind in this human world, which is so full of darkness, can have at least a little more light.